Hello, I'm Judith Richards. I'm the creator of the Richards Trauma Process, or TRTP. I'm going to present today on what is unfortunately uncommon knowledge. And that is what sits behind anxiety. Anxiety. It's a dreadful, dreadful issue, isn't it? So many of us has been, have been in its grip. And I say grip because that's how it used to feel to me when I was in the extreme anxiety of full-blown PTSD. And it, and it feels like we're in its grip, doesn't it? I used to say, I want to let go of it, but it won't let go of me until I found the way to have it let go, fortunately. So anxiety, it's impacting tiny children right through our entire population. It feels like it's in epidemic proportions, and it is. So what can we do about it? To understand it, let's, let's first look at anxiety itself. What happens when we're in the grip of anxiety? What happens? And let's talk about anxiety as a spectrum. The way I see it, my model, is that anxiety is a spectrum from full-blown PTSD to just that undercurrent of anxiety. Let's look at it a little, little more. To do that, let's, let's have a look at the physiology, what actually happens, and my model of why it happens. So let's begin with a normal person who doesn't have anxiety. Let's start here at, at calm. So we have this calm person. They go along. They have a stressful event. They release stress hormones, adrenaline, etc., enough to cope with that event. Note, enough to cope with that event. So they come up here. After the event passes, they self-regulate. And this is key. They self-regulate. They bring themselves down without even trying. It just happens. They go along. They have a life-threatening event. They go up here to fight, flight, freeze. The event passes. And guess what? They self-regulate once more. And that's the story of their life. What happens with anxiety, however, it's a little different. So what happens with anxiety? Let's talk about one of the extreme anxiety diagnoses, PTSD. So let's look at that. What happens is someone has, someone actually gets stuck up here at fight, flight, freeze, continually re-triggering. So that's PTSD. And it can be even possible, it can be worse. It can be right up here where there's no relief. It's just the amygdala on full throttle all the time. It's like the, an accelerator on the brake, pedal to the metal. 24-7, and it's dreadfully uncomfortable. And how do I know? Because I've been there in that state. So that's for PTSD. But let's come down a notch to pretty high anxiety state. So we come along here. Often, as we know, there's panic attacks. So people peak up to fight, flight, freeze during those panic attacks. And that's how they live their life. And then there's, you know, dare we say it? <laughs> there's, there's this sort of garden variety. And we say garden variety because just about everyone, so many in our population have this. And this sort of anxiety, it goes up, it goes down. There's no real pattern to it. And if you have a look here, the, all of it, it's a spectrum. It's a spectrum and it's all anxiety, all of it. Now let's look at why. <laughs> My model is that the stuff of life builds up, the distress of life builds up through our lifetime. It's like the pressure in a balloon. 
there'll be you know various distressing events and that builds up and and up and up and it can be the straw that breaks its camel's back that causes that balloon to blow out in some area some people go into anxiety some go into depression some go into physical illness but something will happen you can only put enough pressure on something for so long before something gives so the, the distress of life distressing events they build up and build up and it can be as i said the straw that breaks the camel's back that makes that balloon bulge out in a particular area into anxiety for example or it can be a catastrophic event or anything in between interestingly the people who are prone to more commonly get ptsd are those whose balloon balloon is already pretty pressurized so for example they've done uh, studies where they have twins going to war very similar circumstances very similar events and one will come with back with back home with PTSD and one won't why because one twin has already gone through distressing events enough to build up the pressure within them like that pressure in the balloon and the dreadfulness of war makes them blow out into PTSD. The other one is more resilient. Why? There's less pressure, less has happened to them. So how does that affect these lower levels of anxiety? Well, it's exactly the same. The stuff of life, the distressing events of life build up and build up and build up until something happens and that person blows out into anxiety at whatever level. Does that make sense? So what do you do about that? Well, let's look at it. What sits behind anxiety? Can I just say, and some people will get upset when I say this and I'm, I'm not diminishing the challenge that living with anxiety is, but anxiety is actually not the issue. So I'll say it again, anxiety is actually not the issue. Why do I say that? What is the issue? If anxiety is not the issue, what is it? Well, what sits behind anxiety? Anxiety is a symptom, a symptom of everything in the person saying, I'm not safe. Why? Why? Let's talk about distressing events, otherwise known as trauma. If we think of trauma, most people think of war and soldiers and emergency services personnel, and certainly there's lots of trauma there. And of course, PTSD. However, it's not just emergency services personnel. It's not just people going to war, defence personnel. No, some houses, I won't call them homes, their houses are war zones. So there's a large population who are living in domestic violence. Uh, in Australia in the last, is it in the last 10 days, eight women have been killed. It's not good. <laughs> So getting back to why is this person stuck with their whole being screaming, I'm not safe, this feeling, I'm not safe. And those who are living in anxiety, you know, you know that feeling. So many when I say I'm not safe, they go, that's it. That's the feeling. I feel like something bad is about to happen. Why? Okay. What happens is when we have a distressing event, otherwise known as trauma, Let's just call it a distressing event because we take the focus off more and major catastrophic events, such as the Black Saturday bush for fire. So let's call it distressing event. So what happens when we have a distressing event? Let's just look at the physiology. We produce stress hormones. Hello, of course we do. Adrenaline, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The amygdala fires. We release those stress hormones. The hippocampus, the part of the brain responsible for memory, the librarian in the brain, doesn't actually, 
once the event is passed, doesn't actually close that memory down, put it away in the right manila folder, in the right file, in the right filing cabinet of memory. It doesn't do that. It just shuts down. It's all too much. Not doing my job. So what happens? Well, that event is never actually brought to an end in our body, in our unconscious. So instead, it actually gets stored like a video tape loop for those young people who don't know about video tape loops. It's like it's stuck on, on replay in the unconscious. Anything similar to that will cause peaks of anxiety. Any anything that we're going through that's as anything similar to what happened then will trigger us off into high anxiety states. So, it's a bugger of a thing, isn't it? What happens is, is when we have these distressing events, we'll have like maybe one when we're five when the hippocampus gets shut down. Maybe we're living in it all the time. Maybe at 13, 20, we've got all these videos going all the time in our unconscious. They break through into the conscious mind with PTSD, with flashbacks. And what is a flashback? It's not just a memory. It's you actually live the event again. You experience it as if it's happening now. So this unconscious videotape loop is broken through into the conscious mind. And we live it as if it's actually happening now. We experience it as if it's actually happening now. However, for people who don't have those flashbacks, it's still happening. It's just not conscious. It goes on in the unconscious mind and the unconscious runs every chemical reaction, every electrical response in the body. It runs in the body as well. This high level of I'm not safe, I'm not safe. Why do I feel I'm not safe? Because of the distressing events that have happened in the past that have never been brought to an end and put away in memory. No, they're running. In my unconscious, all these videotape loops from that time, that time, that time. It's like there's a young me living Groundhog Day then and then and then. Does that make sense? So anxiety is not actually the issue. It's this that's the issue. What's this behind anxiety? It's I'm not safe. Why do I feel I'm not safe? Because I have all these videotape loops happening in my unconscious, in my body, from various times of extreme distress when I was younger. So what we need to do is bring that person to It's over. I'm safe now. How do we do that? Now there's the million dollar question. How do we bring somebody from any of these anxiety states, anxiety being the symptom of the stress that's happened, the stressing events that's happened that leave us feeling I'm not safe because that's running in an unconscious all the time, breaking through into our conscious mind in flashback in extreme PTSD. So how do we bring somebody, for example, from up here, how do we bring them from up here to once again self regulation and only releasing enough stress hormone to deal with the situation at hand. How do we bring that person from I'm not safe to it's over and I'm safe now? Levine, Van der Kolk, all the top trauma experts agree that this is what has to happen. They say the body has to know it's over. I go further. I say the body and the unconscious because it's in the unconscious. The unconscious runs every electrical response in the body, every chemical reaction. The unconscious has to know that it's over. 
And I go further and say, I'm safe now. Why? Why do I do that? You can feel it in your body. The difference between it's over and it's over and I'm safe now. Try it. Try it with me right now. Say with me, it's over. Say it with guts. It's over. Once more. It's over. Good. Now feel the difference when you say it's over and I'm safe now. So try it with me. Ready? It's over and I'm safe now. Good. Try it again. Feel what happens in your body. It's over and I'm safe now. There's resolution there somehow. So we have to bring somebody from I'm not safe, everything in their being, I'm not safe. I don't, something bad's going to happen. And that's why people catastrophize because something bad's going to happen. And it's over and I'm safe now. How do you do that? Well, let's talk about the how. Levine, Bandicoot, all those top experts now agree that two things have to happen in order to bring somebody from I'm not safe to it's over and I'm safe now. One of those things, the first thing, we'll make that bigger. The first thing is the person has to be moved to an empowered position in regard to what happened. Empowered in regard to what happened. The second thing is the body has to know it's over. That's what Levine, Vandercock, those guys say. I say the body and the unconscious, you can call it subconscious, doesn't matter, it's the same thing. And the unconscious has to know. It's over and I'm safe now. When a person gets to that space, when they get there, the symptoms simply disappear. What symptoms? Well, the symptoms of PTSD, such as nightmares, inability to sleep, inability to settle, uh, hypervigilance, headaches, gut shutdown, etc., etc., etc. All those symptoms of PTSD simply disappear. And it's the same with anxiety. The symptoms of anxiety simply disappear. And the whole organism, the whole person comes from that heightened state, often in fight, flight, freeze, that state of I'm not safe, and they come down to calm. It's over and I'm safe now. And they go back into self-regulation. So it's not really rocket science, but how, how, now there's the question, how do we do that? Well, you know how I said those videotape loops get stored in the unconscious as if they're happening now. They've never been brought to an end. So doesn't it make sense that we speak to the person where that distress is stored or where that trauma is stored. Where is that? It's in the unconscious. So we speak directly to the unconscious. How on earth do we speak directly to the unconscious? What is the language of the unconscious? It's the imagination. Just think of your dreams. Anything can happen in your dreams. It doesn't have to make logical sense. So the imagination is the language of the unconscious. So what we do in TRTP, the Richards Trauma Process, is we use that facility to create extraordinary change. We go through various scenarios to move the person to an empowered position in regard to what happened. And that's very simple to just speak directly to the unconscious and say, it's over and you're safe now. <laughs> Sounds too simple, doesn't it? Sounds too simple, but that's exactly what happens. So, for example, um, you can do this 
if you have the skill, and I wouldn't advise anyone to, to, to do this and muck around with it, play with it, unless you know exactly what you're doing. So come and do the training for TRTP if, if this compels you. But what happens when you do this is in the first session, let me go through what we do in order to bring the person to an empowered position in regard to what happened and tell the body and then conscious it's over. We have three sessions. In the first session, we change the negative unconscious core beliefs. So what am I talking about with these unconscious core beliefs? What are they? Well, and for those who know, just bear with me. Even before we're born, up until we're about seven or eight, we take on ideas, ideas of who we are, our place in the world, whether we're loved, whether we're safe, whether we'll be looked after. And these ideas that we take on are branded into our unconscious. And they run the rest of our life. So, for example, if someone takes on the idea, uh, maybe they were born into uh, less than celebration. In fact, resentment, what would happen is they'd take on the idea that those who are supposed to love me will find me a burden. Uh, you know, th those who, who go through dreadfulness in their childhood, they, they come away through that childhood with branded with this unconscious belief that those who are supposed to love me will hurt me, they'll abandon me, they'll betray me. Uh, it's not safe to have anyone close. It's not safe to let anyone love me. It's not safe to love. And anyway, I'm not lovable. I'm a burden. I don't deserve to be treated well. I deserve to be punished. I deserve to suffer. I shouldn't even be here. And so what happens is that person grows up. And what happens when they're trying to have an intimate relationship that's close and safe? Well, the unconscious will keep them safe. Because if we, if we look at the mind, just just think of the mind. Uh, let's just talk about the conscious and the unconscious mind. If we think of the mind as, uh, say, a, a square. And the conscious mind is about that big. Can you see? It's just a little dot in relation to the unconscious, which runs every electrical response, every chemical reaction, everything that happens in the body, everything that happens in our life. And the job of the unconscious is to keep us safe. And if the unconscious is saying it's not safe to be loved, anyone who's supposed to love me will hurt me, and this conscious mind is thinking, hmm, I want to have a loving, intimate relationship. The unconscious will say, you're dreaming. It's not going to happen. I'm not going to allow it and will cause unconscious self-sabotage to get this person out of the relationship and to safety by themselves. That's how it works. Now, if someone has the unconscious core belief that it's not safe to be well, for example, if they've grown up and that distress has built up and built up and they're, they're in a place unconsciously, you understand, of it's not safe to be well, well, then we have to change that in order to create wellness. It, it's pretty simple. So what we do in session one is we change negative unconscious beliefs things such as such as i don't matter i will always fail hello these things have to change in order to get shift right through the entire being that is permanent that's what we want we want powerful shift that is permanent so the first session, we change the unconscious core beliefs so that there will be no sabotage, so that this conscious mind and the unconscious mind are in sync, in agreement. Yep, let's do this. I matter. All these things, we just change them to the positive. It doesn't take long. That's what we do in session one. But what happens then is you think about what's an identity. Ah, Lots of ideas around that. My model is an identity is built on these unconscious core beliefs. 
we take on these ideas that we took when, on when we were little uh, from our tiny person's perception or from things that adults in authority told us, you know, like the year one teacher who says, you're stupid, you'll never pass any, any exams, you'll, you'll never get a job. And that, well, they must know. So we change these unconscious core beliefs because that runs the rest of our life. But what happens is we, we base our identity on them. So, for example, that person who as a child was told they were stupid, well, they grow up, well, you know, and they create this delusion which they live. I'm this person who is stupid, who will never amount to anything. I'm this person who doesn't matter. I'm this person who deserves to suffer. I'm this person who deserves to be punished. Therefore, I find people, I'm drawn to people who will punish me in order to fulfill that. This is the person I am. Myself, I grew up with some very unfortunate unconscious core beliefs. One was I attract violent lunatics. Good people do bad things to me and it's my fault. Therefore, as a good little Catholic girl, I must be evil. There's something wrong with me. I am evil. I deserve to be punished. I deserve to suffer. And so what happened was my whole life played out like that. I used to introduce myself as a teenager. I remember, it's, hi, I'm Jude. I attract violent lunatics. What can I say? It's a gift. Because wherever I went, there were the, the most amazing things would happen. Terrible things. Until I understood this, and until I found a way to quickly, quickly change those unconscious core beliefs, I'm happy to report that I have for many, many years now lived in a loon-free zone. No violence, no stalkers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So when we change someone's unconscious core beliefs, we actually change the patterns that run their life. You know, their patterns of abuse. You know, we, we see again and again people going from one violent relationship, abusive relationship, to another abusive relationship, to another abusive relationship. You change their unconscious core beliefs, that pattern stops. And a much more healthy pattern begins. Their whole experience of who they are changes. So in session one, we change the unconscious core beliefs to the positive so that there'll be no self-sabotage as we go forward. We introduce the person to who they are, not this delusion that they've created, built on these negative unconscious core beliefs, but the reality. And so many of us have experienced that. You know, we, we think we're this person. This is who we believe we are. Someone meets us and they see the reality better than we do and says, wow, you are fabulous, you are blah, blah, blah. And we go, hello, what do you want? You're obviously not seeing the reality. I know who I am and I'm not good enough. I'll never be good enough. I don't matter, etc., etc. So session one, we change our unconscious core beliefs to the positive and we introduce the person then to who they are with positive unconscious core beliefs. For most people, for a lot of people, that session in itself is transformative. <laughs> I had a, a client recently a clinical psychologist and after session one her daughter who was about 12 said mommy I, I don't like this change in you you're not putting everybody else first anymore what's wrong and all that had happened was this woman who used to run around run herself ragged you know seeing people's needs before they even knew they had them and attending to them now actually had some value, some self-respect and actually was treating herself as if she mattered as well. So that's the sort of thing that happens in session one. I used to work with violent, uh, angry men brought against their will, you know, the sort of thing. They'd been under house arrest for a couple of days or pulled off their ex-partner that morning or the night before um, trying to strangle them or whatever. And they saw themselves as angry, evil, violent men. And in a couple of hours, they would walk out and they would be safe and everybody in their world 
would be safe. I haven't lost one yet. Why? Because we work with this stuff where it lives, which is in the unconscious. How do we do that? By using the imagination. So session one, we change the negative unconscious core beliefs to the positive. Session two. I'll write over this. Two is where the rubber hits the road. This is where the empowerment comes in. We move the person to a place of empowerment in regard to the events that happened. We only need to do the top three or four. We don't have to go back through every distressing event in the life. Just the top three or four. And then in the third session, we create the future. Because if you're living in anxiety, not that we create the future. If you're living in anxiety, it's very hard to put yourself into a positive future because you're coming from this overwhelming urge, this feeling that I'm not safe. So therefore, the future is not going to be safe. So when that ceases, when the person comes, by the end of the session, second session, they come from I'm not safe to it's over and I'm safe now. At the end of that second session, we're ready to create a positive future. So that's what we do. So we'll leave it there for now because it's just a short presentation. Using this process in this way, <laughs> well, this way is the process, but using this process, you can take somebody from extreme PTSD all the way down through the lower levels of anxiety and also you can deal with depression. You can resolve that. You can step, take somebody by the hand. I've got you. You're safe. I know exactly what to do. The um, professional mental health people that I've taught over the last four years, they say that they used to come home exhausted at the end of the day, exhausted and frustrated. Some of them even admit to shame that the people sitting in front of them, that they could only do so much to help them. Now they go home at the end of the day, they report exhilarated because they see change. Why? Because we deal with the stuff, the reason for the symptom of anxiety, which is the dreadfulness that's happened in the past and I'm, parts of me are stuck back there. We deal with that very quickly, very effectively, very safely without re-traumatizing and we see change. We tra see transformation quickly generally by the end of the second session. But it's a three-session process. Very occasionally it's four. So there we are. Uncommon knowledge. What's its behind anxiety? And you know, it's I'm not safe. Why am I not safe? Why do I feel like that? I just feel I'm not safe. I'm not safe. Why do I feel like that? Because... I'm, things have happened in my past that have left me with these videotape loops going on from different ages, different stages of my life. That happened, that happened, that happened, that happened. And they're still playing. They've never been brought to an end. So my body is reacting as if those things are happening now. It's happening now. It's happening now. The bushfire is coming now. He's got a knife now. My father is beating me now. My mother is being incredibly cruel. It, all these things. The pressure in the balloon of life builds up. The pressure of these distressing events builds up and builds up until we blow out and it can be the straw that breaks the camel's back or it can be a catastrophic event or anything in between and we blow out into anxiety. Some blow out into depression, some into physical illness. It doesn't matter. Put enough pressure on something and something will give. And often people go into anxiety and it's a spectrum. 
anxiety is a spectrum, all with the same cause. How can I say that? How can I say that that's the cause of anxiety? Because the only thing that matters is the result. Using this model, this way of thinking, we have taken hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people through three sessions, sometimes four, but generally three sessions to be anxiety free. And some of them, yes, we have tracked and stay in touch with for four years, some of them five years. So there we are. The proof's in the pudding, as they say. What is the outcome? So we are, that's what we're doing. The thing is that there is a tsunami of pain out there a tsunami of pain and it's just starting to break when you start to look at epigenetics now the science of epigenetics showing that trauma is actually passed down from generation to generation in the dna so what's happened in the last century you look at the 20th century and the dreadfulness that happened then it's being passed down it's exacerbated by what's going on in our society now so we're not going to go into the causes but the reality is that our hospitals are overwhelmed, our professional mental health and health people are, are overwhelmed. What do we do? Because what we are using doesn't cut it. Cognitive behavioural therapy is fabulous for lots of things. But the thing is that trauma, otherwise known as distressing events, is not stored in the cognitive brain. It's stored in the unconscious. That's why it takes a long time to change things um, a psychiatrist called me um, months ago and said i want to do your training i said why he said because i run a i'm in charge of a trauma unit at a major hospital and i'm an expert in ptsd i'm published and etc cetera, etc cetera. he presents on ptsd uh, and i've been dealing with this patient for nine years every fortnight we have have an appointment I see him every fortnight we've been getting nowhere he came back to me this morning for a normal fortnightly appointment having seen one of your students not even a graduate a student he's gone through your three sessions and has come back absolutely well if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes if I didn't know him well enough to know what he has for breakfast I wouldn't have believed it because it's impossible so I obviously don't know what I'm doing so I better come and learn but that is what we would expect using this process it's, it's very simple and it's an extraordinary thing you know that the simplest of ideas are often the revolutionary ones so and some people will say well that's not possible well that's fine keep believing that and they used to believe the world was flat but we have to do something different from what we're doing because we are drowning here there are people dying out there the suicide rate in, in Australia is extraordinary. In my family, three. I know the pain of that. I know the, the ripple effect that goes out with that. We have to do something different. What we're doing takes too long. We need something fast. We need something effective that actually fixes things, resolves these, the dreadful challenge that anxiety is that ptsd is so if this compels you if you'd like to join a warm extraordinary mutually supportive community well it's more than a community it's a tribe it's becoming a revolution if you'd like to find out more about this work go to the website go to the training page the website is now this is a long <laughs> it's a long name that richards i'm judith richards that richards trauma process it's all one word dot com you can look at more information there 
you can check out the training page. It's an eight-week intensive followed by membership of this extraordinary community. If you believe that if we continue to do what we've always done, we'll continue to get the same results, that the status quo, which insists on being kept, needs to be pushed, needs to be challenged. We need to do something different from what we're doing in order to change our society, to take away all the pain and hurt people, hurt people. It's not rocket science. So what do you do? You take away the hurt, they stop hurting each other. It's so simple. And this works. If this draws you, check it out. On the training page, you can actually make an appointment for 20 minutes to talk to somebody. Somebody on my team will call you at that appointed time and you can talk. Have any questions answered? Our small end point is to change how mental health is done. To lower the suicide rate. To take people by the hand through to the other side of their distress, their pain. To stop people hurting people because they're so hurt. Join us. This is important work. Thank you. Go gently. Bye.